So, major world economic and trade powers, namely the United States, China, Russia, and the European Union are locked in a fresh battle over Africa's human and natural resources. In the past few weeks, top envoys from Beijing, Washington, and Brussels have touched down in different parts of the continent, looking to convince Africa of what they have to offer. In the meantime, a report published on August the 3rd by the Economic Intelligence Unit says that China is aiming to overtake the EU as Africa's biggest trade partner by the year 2030. And there is more. I'm turning now to Matthias Chika Modi, an economist and, C and one-time CEO of the National Competitiveness Council of Nigeria for some perspectives. Modi is also an adjunct professor at the John Hopkins University in the United States. It's great to have you. Good morning to you at the other side of the Atlantic this evening here in, in Nigeria. Thank you so much for coming through. Um, thank you, Boston, and, and thanks for having for me. Quite some time. Thanks, thank you so much. Is it really possible pleasure. that China could overtake the EU as Africa's biggest trading partner by the year 2030? What do you think? It is possible, but it will take a lot of courage to make that bet, and um, for a variety of reasons. I feel some of that report was influenced by a long-term trend, and more importantly, what happened last year. So last year you had a very dramatic growth, 35% growth in total um, Chinese trade with Africa. But beyond last year, it's been cons consistently um, below $200 billion. And that trend, um, there are fundamentals that explain why it stayed there. Now, if you look forward to the future, um, there are many factors that, that can affect that. Most of them serve as returns. And what do I mean by this? You know, you mentioned Russia, there are many new kids on the block as well. The Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia, um, Russia, who you mentioned, India, um, the UK, because since Brexit, they've had to negotiate trade agreements bilateral with countries within the continent, um, as well as Turkey and Brazil. And everyone is trying to get a share of the pie in terms of African trade. Um, that, as well as the Ukrainian war, because one of the things the Ukrainian war did was to cause um, Europe North America and all of the G7 really to rethink their energy sourcing. So as, as we speak, in now the Italian gas giant is negotiating in Congo Brazzaville and the, their strategy is to replace Russian gas with African gas. And on the American side of it, President Biden signed um, the Chief Act last week, which is to encourage domestic production so that there will be less reliance on China, as well as the ongoing effort to diversify manufacturing away from China within Southeast Asia. So all of these factors, it's a composite, would retard the level of growth. So it would take a lot of um, bravery to bet that that would happen by then. The EU does one third of the trade mm. with our continent, and there are very strong colonial linkages that will be hard to or put overnight. Uh, interesting, if you know how many visitors we've gotten in the last few weeks, uh, uh, Matthias, uh, the United States Secretary of State, uh, Anthony Blinken, was in Africa last week. He was talking of support for America. He was asking Africa not to warm up to either China or Russia. What's your take? Well, it's interesting. I mean, President Biden is having a summit in December, I believe, and um, with, with, Af with the Africans, and of course, um, China had done this before. So Africa is a beautiful bride now that a lot of com countries are trying to um, wed. And um, the reasons are obvious. You have a young, growing population. So not only does it create a market, it creates an opportunity for cheap labor for manufacturing. Um, side by side with that is the need for rare earth, you know, natural resources and energy as well. So you're seeing that um, happen. The problem, um, America, the, one of the challenges they face is the fact that um, there used to be a permanent resident in Africa, right? But in the Trump years, there's a lot of disengagement. And that disengagement had a lot of ramifications. One of it was some sort of recession, democratic recession, we saw democracy, you know, backsliding on the continent. More importantly, l less economic engagement. And um, now a few people are asking if there's a change in government in 2024, um, how much, how permanent can this be? Right. But having said that, America is a natural partner for the continent in terms of the aspirations of young Africans, in terms of democracy and free markets. There are many reasons why we embrace, and obviously there are cultural issues why we embrace um, the United States. So I feel that, that there will be some success, but it's not going to be to the extent that is uh, perhaps anticipated. 
Well, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure the Americans, the, the Europeans, the Chinese and Russians know exactly what they want. But I often ask myself, what type of economic and trade competitiveness partner do Africa need at this point in time? Very good question. So, you know, with China's Belt and Road Initiative and a lot of the move that the Chinese have made, if, despite all of that, if you look at the actual trade and you decompose that, you're going to find out that almost everything China is importing from Africa is some primary, what I mean, some oils, like primary products. So um, oil and gas, um, diamonds, iron ore, and very primary products. So Angola, South Africa, the biggest providers of that at the moment. Now, if you look at what they export, it's more complex products, more value added. And Nigeria is the largest importer from, from China. So China is very clever about what they're trying to do. Russia, similarly, and the Gulf states as well. So there's food, agriculture, but it's not primary products where little value is extracted by African countries. So African countries have to look out for trade agreements where, first of all, they can extract a lot more from the value on the value chain. So they get more and retain more than the value of the, you know, from the value of whatever it is they're exporting. Um, they have to have partners who are willing to put capital in terms that are, um, you know, terms that are, easy to make terms that are not onerous for African countries so that there can be significant capital injection. Third, thirdly, they have to have partners who um, whose engagement is transparent, it's ethical, and helps support democracy. Because one of the, unfortunately, one of the ways the Chinese and the Russians have engaged in a way that has promoted um, despots and, and you know, sort of been anti-democratic, anti-free market. And I feel the final Thing that matters as well when thinking of a partner has to be you have to think about um, the long term and how open those markets will be so today um, um china is one of the fastest growing economies not as fast as they used to grow which is one of the reasons why i think supplanting the eu might not happen by 2030 chinese domestic market was growing double digit over 10 percent for a very long time but in the past six seven years it's been very stable single digit and there's no sign that's about to increase. Um, the final thing about the trade agreement is that they have to show the kind of militarization that is going on at the moment. So a lot of the early Chinese loans and Gulf loans were tied to physical property, landed property, farms and the rest of it. And at that time, Afghan leaders probably thought enforcing those loans in terms of def in the case of default would not be practical. But China has a military base in Djibouti. This year, they've opened one in Equatorial Guinea. There's this increased militarization going on in the continent. Um, Russia has approval now from Sudan to set up a military base. Um, African leaders have to be very wary about this and, in fact, should be scared about it. Um, trade it does not mean militarizing your country. And as we speak, there are something like 42 um, seaports that are Chinese built and, in many ways, uh, collateral for loans as well. Um, that does not all go well. For, for the country. Okay, uh, you, you've touched on this a bit earlier. What should inform Africa's decision on a long-term and sustainable basis? For example, uh, let me use the energy transition conversation around the world right now. We're having that conversation, energy transition. We have oil and gas, we have gas energy poverty on the continent. They suddenly, Russia brought the world on us in Ukraine. Now we're trying to fill the gap and supporting Europe in terms of uh, energy support. But we also need this gas at home, for example, in Nigeria, to get, to get what you call cooking gas, as well as energy that we need for electricity. So do you think it's going to be a very tough decision for Africa to decide who to go to bed with between the traditional friends who has been disappointing, the EU and, West, and the United States on one hand, and Russia and China coming out of the Far East and say, here we are, we are your friends? Well, first of all, let me say, I don't like to think of Africa as monolithic, it's not homogeneous. Different countries have different contexts and different um, aspirations and, and challenges they face and opportunities as well. So if you were an oil and gas exporting country, if you're like a Nigeria or an Angola or DRC or Gabon or Guinea, you face, you face very different um, circumstances from if you were, say, exporting food and you're importing a net energy importer. But what is across, but what should be common should be the idea that, first of all, we should be able to move up the value chain. So if, if you have a partner, that partner has to be one that is not just willing to take gas or take oil, but for example, should be willing to 
refine those commodities or liquefy gas, for example, within those countries and export them. So that some of the value is retained within the country to allow um, skills, allow capacity building and skill acquisition within those countries as well. So that the countries, after the next, when there's not an oil boom and there's now some stability or there's an oil shock, there should be some diversity of income. And that would only come when you build capacity that can be moved to other industries. So I feel these are um, critical considerations, um, not just to sell, but what are you going to bring to us? Are you going to bring knowledge to us? Are you going to invest in us by bringing capital? Are you going to give us the capacity to produce and retain some of the value that we create on, on this primary products? Well, and just export primary products. Well, interesting. So much for uh, those uh, your time and insight on this, uh, uh, this tonight. Thank you so much, Matthias Chikamodi, economist and adjunct professor at the John Hopkins University in the United States and former CEO of the National Competitiveness Council of Nigeria. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.